Good morning and welcome to our service of worship for December 27th, 2020. I trust that all of you had a wonderful Christmas with the family members you were able to spend time with and we look forward to a great 2021 as believers, maybe even for the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, by the way, a couple of things. We are going to resume worship at the church January 3rd. We're going to resume our Thursday Bible studies, confirmation classes at the church. Um, so our regular schedule, but again, observing the social distancing uh, issues that we were before we uh, totally closed down. So I look forward to maybe seeing many of you at church on the 3rd. Also, because 2021 is coming up very quickly, uh, I have a new uh, daily Bible reading plan for us to use. And I did take a screenshot and posted that on my Facebook page. If you can't read it, if it's too small, let me know. I'll try something uh, other to try and get those details out to you. I'll do it a month at a time. I took a screenshot of the month of January. But anyway, as we begin our call to worship or, or beginning our service of worship this morning, our call to worship is taken from the words of one of the church's most well-loved hymns. Our Savior's love. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner, condemned, unclean. And yet that's what Christmas is all about, right? The amazing love of God for sinners like us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the celebration of Christmas this past week. And we thank you that you are coming again in all your power and glory to complete the plan of redemption and bring those who love you and serve you and worship you and belong to you to be with you for all eternity. How grateful we are for that reality, which is ours in Christ Jesus, our Lord, even this morning, for we ask it in this precious name. Amen. Let me share just a couple more verses of the hymn, My Savior's Love with you this morning. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned and clean. How marvelous, how wonderful. And my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. When with the ransomed in glory his face I at last shall see, t'will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be, how marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. That is the ongoing reality that we embrace and we experience as those who belong to the Savior through faith. Our scripture reading uh, for this morning, taken from our daily Bible readings, is from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. 
No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Here ends the reading of God's word for this morning. John, in his first letter, begins testifying to this message of joy, which is ours in Christ. From chapter 1, John writes, We are telling you about what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you may share the fellowship and the joys we have with the Father and with Jesus Christ, his Son. And if you do as I say in this letter, then you too will be full of joy, and so will we. In the next breath, John reminds us that knowing Christ has changed our relationship with the sin that separate us from God in the first place. Chapter 1, verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If coming to know Christ has not changed our relationship with sin, we probably have not really come to know him and are still missing out on the real joy of Christmas. In the second chapter of this letter, John reminds us that it is our new relationship with sin that will prepare us to experience the joy of Christmas for all eternity when Christ our Savior comes again for a second time. Verses 28 and 29 of chapter 2. And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. Only those who consistently say no to sin and yes to the things of God can be confident and unashamed at Christ's second coming. That brings us to our passage this morning from 1 John chapter 3. Here John deals with the implications of being believers. Let's begin looking at the first part of verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Because of what Christ has done for those who believe, our standing with God has changed and changed dramatically. Before coming to know Christ, we were enemies of God. But now, by the grace of God, we are children of God. Our standing or position has changed. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called. Children of God. And that is what we are. We who belong to Christ are children of God by virtue of adoption. Christ, by virtue of his death and resurrection, has intervened on our behalf. Those who believe are now covered with his love. And his love has made it possible for us to be adopted into his family. Prior to coming to faith in Christ, we were alienated from God, without hope and without God, as Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. But now... By means of his intervention, we who believe are now children of God. Our status has changed. Our position has changed. Our relationship with the triune God has changed. As many of you know, we have five adopted children. 
before Mary and I intervened and initiated the adoption process. Brett and Chris, Keith and Andy and Nick had no standing in our family. But by means of adoption, they are members of our family forever. Because of what Christ has done, those of us who believe are treasured members of God's own family. By means of the adoption process initiated by Christ by virtue of his atoning sacrifice on the cross on our behalf. Isn't that wonderful? Now let's add the second part of verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. When we come to know Christ, we may still be in the world, but we are no longer of it. Our values, our priorities, our loyalties have changed. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. In John chapter 18, verse 36. By his grace at work in us, we now love him, not the world. As John reminds us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because of the love of Christ at work in us, our relationship with the world has dramatically changed day by day. We are becoming more and more like the Savior and less and less like those in the world around us. Does that make sense to you? It does to me when I became a believer. All of a sudden, everything changed. The friends I once had didn't hold the same relationship with me anymore. I began to look for friends among those who were believers in Christ. It's a change in our relationship with the world around us that Paul addresses in the opening verses of Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. That can happen. Because by the grace of God, we have a new capacity to think God's thoughts after him and put into practice the will of God for our lives. Now let's look at verse 2 of 1 John chapter 3. Dear friends, we are now children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. By the grace of God in Christ Jesus, our lives are daily being transformed. We are literally new creations. But all that God has planned for us is not yet on full display. That process of becoming more and more like the Savior will continue until Christ comes again, and then the process will be complete, and we shall be like him. But until then, 
we keep pressing on, displaying more and more evidence of our new standing as children of God, as Paul writes in Romans chapter 3. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have yet taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal. To win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Having just celebrated again the birth of the Savior, may our ambition and desire be the same as that of the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John. Forgetting what is behind, all that we were when we were dead in our transgressions and sins, straining towards what is ahead, daily becoming all that God has planned for us to be in his Son as children of God. We press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus, the prize of being children of God for all eternity, children that fully bear the likeness of the one who gave his life that we might be adopted into God's own family. Men and women who have a new standing with God. Men and women who have been born again by the Spirit of God. Men and women who have a new relationship with the world. Men and women who have a new relationship with sin. Men and women who will one day not only see Christ in all his fullness and glory, but in that day we'll, we will be like him for all eternity. What a calling. What a destiny. Verse 3 of John chapter, 1 John chapter 3. All who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. My friends, by the grace of God in Christ Jesus, we are destined for glory. Never forget that. And that reality should daily impact the way we live. Until we leave this world or until Christ comes again, whichever comes first, our calling is to purify ourselves just as he is pure. Knowing that the end result of our redemption is to be more and more like Jesus. It makes sense that with all that is within us, that we would daily be seeking to be more like him. And we do that by saying no to sin and those sinful desires that used to dominate our lives and instead saying yes to the things of God, those things that mark us as belonging to him and mark us as belonging to the same family as our Savior and Lord. Jesus Christ. I love how, how the Apostle Paul describes that process in his new relationship with Christ in Philippians chapter 3. But whatever gains, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, 
and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. In other words, the Apostle Paul, more than anything, wanted to live his life for Christ, becoming more like him daily. As children of God, we are on a mission to daily cling to Christ and all that pleases him until we enter eternity and take up residence in our eternal home in the heavens. As we come to the closing words of our passage for this morning, verses 4 through 6, it should come as no surprise that the Apostle John again reminds us that as children of God, our relationship to sin has changed forever. Verses 4 through 6. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin as a pattern of life has either seen him or know him. John is well, well aware of the fact that as even as believers, we are still in a struggle with sin. Uh, and by his grace, we are sinning less and less every day. And when we do sin, we have permission for that. We confess our sins. And John tells us in the beginning, uh, the end of chapter 1 and verse 2, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But here John reminds us that Christ appeared to take away our sins. And so if we continue to live in sin, it is evident that we have not come to know him. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning as the pattern of their life. No one who continues to sin as a way of life has neither seen him or known him. Pretty sobering words. But let me close with those wonderful words with which we begin in 1 John chapter 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are. Wow. I trust those will be great words to meditate on as you begin this week. Let's join in reciting the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we close our service, let me share with you words of the hymn, Once in David's Royal City. <clears throat> Once in Royal David's City stood a lowly caddo shed, where a mother laid her baby in a manger for his bed. Mary was that mother mild, Jesus Christ, her little child. He came down to earth from heaven, who is God and Lord of all. And his shelter was a stable and his cradle was a stall. With the poor and mean and lowly lived on earth our Savior holy. And our eyes at last shall see him 
through his own redeeming love for that child so dear and gentle is our Lord in heaven above. And he leads his children on to the place where he is gone. Now may the grace and mercy and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit rest upon your life this day and forevermore. Amen.